So my name is Patrice Kelch, and I am uh, a longtime member of Common Ground and a student of the Dharma, and really happy, happy to be here with you all um, this evening. Um, and um, so I ask people sort of what they do when they're not practicing, or um, so what I do when I'm not uh, involved with common ground is um, I uh, sit with um, people who are incarcerated at Stillwater Correctional Facility, and I've been doing that for a little more than two decades, try to do that at least once a month, All, and there are some other volunteers who go, although it just might interest you to know that one of the issues at a lot of the correctional facilities right now is simply that um, they're really hard to staff. Um, so their, their, um, their numbers are, are really low. So it's often the case that programs get canceled and there's a lockdown or something just because there's not enough staff. And that's really hard. You now, if you're counting on people coming and sitting with you to, um, to not be able to do that. Uh, and it's, it's hard for the staff is doing the best they can, but that's just something I kind of keep in my heart because there have been a couple of times where you know, a couple of months in a row, I've been scheduled to go out and I get a notice that there's just not enough staff. So they're going to have to put people on lockdown. So, um, and I'm also on uh, the board of the Minnesota Multi-Faith Network, which is a really interesting um, organization that believes that people should be talking to and, and with each other across um, learning about each other's um, practices, learning, I think, mostly about each other's goodness, which has been really um, interesting. And I'm also um, pretty active with Isaiah and Faith in Minnesota, which is an organization that works to make legislative changes for a truly um, multiracial democracy and a caring economy and a just climate future. So, and I personally find that that there's Dharma work in all of that. Um, is anyone new here tonight for the first time to this session? Two people, great. Well, I just want you to know how, how very welcome you are. And the format for this group is um, that we'll sit for about 30 minutes, um, give you a minute or two to stretch and um, and then I'll make some remarks. And um, I hope that I have things timed so that people are welcome to have some discussion, ask questions um, afterwards. Um, and I wanna begin um, our program this evening with um, a land acknowledgement. And common ground is cited on the traditional, ancestral and contemporary homelands of the Dakota people. And I'm actually talking about this spot, this spot that is close to the Bedote, the sacred uh, place of creation for the Dakota people, which is at the confluence of the Mississippi and the Minnesota rivers. We're near what we call St. Anthony Falls, which was a, again, another sacred site, a powerful site, um, just kind of, um, East and north of us was at one time um, a maple forest where the uh, indigenous people did a lot of their sugaring. Um, and of course, there was the village that's on um, uh, Bede Makaska. So this was a, this site where we are was um, a really important place. And it holds great historical, spiritual and personal significance to the original inhabitants and to uh, and their descendants who live here today and to their future descendants. We acknowledge the sovereignty of native nations and our obligations to live up to treaty agreements. It is our intention to rectify the harms that we have committed and those we continue to commit. This land acknowledgement is only one small part of supporting indigenous communities. It is our hope that our land acknowledgement statement will
will inspire others to stand with us in solidarity with Native nations and to amplify the voices of Indigenous people who are leading grassroots change movements. So, okay. So let's um, do our mindfulness sit for about 30 minutes. And um, what I would invite you to do is to be comfortable in your posture. And um, when I first started back in like 1994, um, the instructions that Mark gave, he said, you know, we try to cultivate stillness here, um, but if you, it's okay if you have to move, if you're in pain. You know, he said, we're just move mindfully. He said, we're here to bring about an end to suffering, not to cause more suffering. And that was the moment I thought, this is the practice for me. So um, as you practice tonight, uh, practice with some sense of comfort and ease, finding that balance between um, attention, alertness, and relaxation. Because interestingly enough, being relaxed is actually the proximate cause of uh, concentration or better than to say a concentration, like a collected mind. Okay, concentration sounds so, so stiff, but being relaxed is actually conducive to a collected mind. So. As we begin our practice this evening, I would encourage you to invite your whole selves into your practice, into this room, into your practice. Not to compartmentalize, not just to bring out the good meditator part, in fact, letting go of any idea of what a good meditator is or what a good meditation is. Letting go of fixed ideas. Allowing yourself to be in your body just as it is, this imperfect body, this imperfect mind, just how it is. The wonderful teacher Ruth King often talks about our experience as being imperfect, impersonal, and impermanent. So that's just how it is. And we just sit with that. And I would encourage you, if it feels right, to practice with a relaxed, receptive awareness. So often in practice, we're trying to get somewhere, trying to make something happen. And even if we're not conscious of it, sometimes there's just a real striving energy underneath our mindfulness, which actually turns out to be kind of a hindrance to our really being present with how things are.
So I would encourage you as best you can just to be with yourself with some ease, with some kindness, to take in the support that we give to and get from each other by sitting together. Our mindfulness is seeing what really is present for us in the present moment. And we practice with a kind of ease that just allows us to see clearly what's arising in the body, in the mind, what's passing away without clinging to it, without pushing it away. And when we notice clinging or pushing away or judgment, just to recognize, oh, that's what's going on right now. And that's a moment of knowing, a moment of mindfulness. So let's just practice in silence, but a silence infused with kindliness, with welcoming, with a kind of tender care for ourselves.
So folks in the room, take a minute to stretch, maybe say hello to the person next to you, introduce yourself. And maybe folks who are on Zoom might want to just put in the chat um, where they're Zooming from. Say hello and where they're Zooming from. Oh, wow, someone from Champaign and Seattle. Excellent. Excellent. Oh, great. So we're here in the room and <clears throat> folks are coming in from, um, I believe it's Champaign, uh, Illinois, uh, and um, Seattle, Pine River, Bloomington, St. Paul, Minneapolis. Um, so anyway, thanks everyone for, for being here. So tonight my topic is uh, relational dharma as a path of practice. And I know that among um, my um, cohort, often, um, you know, we say, well, you know, how's your practice going? And usually the response is something like, well, you know, I try to sit every morning for at least 45 minutes and I uh, listen to dharma talks when I can and you know, show up at common ground or, you know, that we, we tend to talk about our practice as our formal, uh, our formal mindfulness practice or our formal sitting practice. And um, we don't usually um, talk about our practice as relational practice um, nearly as, um, as much. And um, for those of you who've heard me talk before, what I almost always talk about is how the most important thing about us as a species is our tremendous capacity for care. And we're not the only species who cares. I mean, especially among the primates, we see a lot of care, a lot of pro-social behavior. Um, but what we notice about human beings is that human beings can not only care for other human beings outside of their own kin structure, um, care about people they don't know at all, people who are really different, care a lot about other, other species. And um, I remember um, years ago when I was at, um, I was sort of coordinating a, a chaplaincy program for United Theological. And one of the um, uh, students who was actually a Quaker, she said, you know, the one thing I really love about the Buddhist is they really take into account the possibility of alien life. They have, you know, like wishing well for all beings, all possible beings. And I just thought that was pretty, pretty charming. Um, so we do have this, you know, tremendous capacity um, for care. And none of us would be here today if other human beings hadn't cared enough about us to keep us alive. You know, I mean, this is, is sort of the great, the great thing about being a human being is we just have this tremendous capacity to care about um, not only um, you know sort of animals but nature. I mean, we just it's it's um, it's just this remarkable um, ability that the heart can really open to all these kinds of things. Um, and you know, if if we look at the eightfold path um, 
we'll see how many of those practices are really focused on relations. And as I was preparing this, I thought this is going to be like sort of speed dating the top hits in Buddhism. But um, so we're going to go over a lot of sort of familiar, what may be familiar material, maybe not for, for everyone. But as I started to think about it, there's just so much in the teachings that is all about how we relate skillfully to each other. So in the Eightfold Path, which is the you know, the, the path that when we talk about the, um, the Buddhist analysis of how things, how things are, um, that we all experience suffering in some way. And it's, the word is dukkha. And etymologically, it comes from like the hub of a wheel being out of alignment with the axle. So it's, it's um, dukkha is really being out of alignment. So it's most often translated as suffering, but it's stress, distress, um, unease. Um, it's, and if you go back to that etymological um, root, that, that session, that idea that we're just somehow out of alignment with how things have, have come to be. And so the, uh, you know, the Buddha's analysis is that we have uh, we recognize that there's suffering, there's dukkha, distress in our lives. There's a cause for it, um, and the cause is our clinging, our you know clinging to um, the what, what we want, or clinging to wishing that things were sort of different than they were. It's that sort of <clears throat> pushing away, not being satisfied with. Um, we don't, we don't have what we want. Sometimes people say it's, you know, we, um, we don't have what we want. We get what we don't want. It's that whole idea of um, this, this kind of, of um, the, in the poly, it, it's called, it's like a thirst that can never be, be satisfied. Although some uh, contemporary practitioners, uh, foremost among them, uh, Stephen Batchelor, talks about dukkha actually as our reactivity, that that's the cause of our suffering, that, that to understand it in a more contemporary psychological framework, that our, our suffering is often about our reactivity to how things are, the circumstances we, we find ourselves in. So we have uh, suffering, there's a cause of suffering, um, there's uh, the possibility of cessation, and the way we do that is to follow the Eightfold Path. So you know, the Buddha gives us a, a kind of map of how we can develop ourselves um, to, uh, to end our suffering. And the first part is about sort of wise or skillful view, which is understanding the four causes. It's um, recognizing um, cause and effect, that things just don't happen spontaneously, that there's always a cause sometimes multiple causes, constellation of causes, but that the, um, the world is in some sense a very lawful world. There are always, there are causes. So a lot of our practice is trying when something happens to go back and understand what the causes were so that we can avoid the, uh, the effect again. So we have um, this, this skillful understanding of cause and effect, which also is actually karma. Karma is looking at sort of our intentional actions and what are their consequences. Just it's it, so that's what, when we have, we begin with this sort of wise view, this skillful view, skillful understanding. And um, the word Vipassana, which sometimes we talk about our Vipassana practice, we often say, you know, that's, un, that's how things are, seeing how things are. But actually the, the really literal translation of that and the better translation is, seeing how things have come to be, understanding how things have come to be. So it has this sort of, um, <clears throat> uh, it's not just, oh, this is how things, but understanding. Everything that, that has come to be has come to be out of, out of causes. Um, the second part of the Eightfold Path is wise or skillful intention. And that um, could be either understood as renunciation, giving up things, or generosity. Um, 
and it's um, goodwill, loving kindness, and it is non-harming. And that's all pretty relational. So the idea of, of generosity, of um, goodwill or loving kindness, metta, and this intention not to harm, again, very, very relational. Um, when we talk about skillful speech, it is speech that is timely, truthful, helpful, and offered in a spirit of loving kindness or a spirit of non-harming. Again, that this is one of the aspects of the path is going to be how we how we relate to each other through speech, um, skillful action. And uh, this is often characterized as um, the precepts, but it's um, refraining from killing or from harming, refraining from taking what's not freely given to us, refraining from sexual misconduct or sexual harm, refraining again from, from false or harmful speech, and refraining from um, ingesting anything that would cause us to be careless. Sometimes that's just uh, refraining from intoxicants, but if we think about it as refraining from ingesting anything, whether it's movies, I mean, it's not just um, sort of alcohol or, or um, pharmaceuticals, it's refraining from taking in anything that is going to make us, and again, in Stephen Batchelor, sometimes this is translated as heedless, but Stephen Batchelor translates it as careless in both senses of the word, in being heedless, not caring how things happen, but also being heartless. So carelessness can be understood both as being heedless and being, being heartless. So again, this is all about how we relate to each other. Um, skillful livelihood is the, um, the fifth of the eight precepts. And um, in the Buddhist time, the way the Buddha talked about this was dealing in weapons, poisons, or in living beings, both animal and human. So not engaging in um, the slaughter of animals, um, not engaging in slavery, not engaging in prostitution, um, and um, or uh, dishonest practices. He talked about it, how important it was for people who are merchants to be fair and to be engaged in, um, in really ethical, um, ethical practices. And today people talk about um, you know, being involved as best they can in uh, occupations that um, are not harmful to others, not harmful to the earth, not harmful to other persons, and um, you know, and it, it's it's a practice. Um, when we talk about uh, and so that so we'll, the the eightfold path. To just step back for a moment. It's like the, the first two about wise uh, understanding and wise intention. That's kind of the wisdom part. This middle part of wise speech, wise um, uh, livelihood and um, wise action are some, called sila, uh, morality, the ethical, ethical part. And it's only the last three parts of the Eightfold Path that are specifically about a meditation practice. And that's um, for skillful and wise effort. And that's about um, not, um, as best you can, not bringing about unwholesome thoughts, if you've got unwholesome thoughts, doing the best you can to eliminate them, to um, sustaining, uh, bringing about uh, wholesome thoughts and um, cultivating them, sustaining wholesome thoughts. And um, you can think about this as very much like our, our metta practice. You know, how often in, in metta practice, our intention is to abandon ill will as best we can and to cultivate this kind of wholesome um, concern for our own welfare and the welfare of, of others. Um, and then there is um, skillful mindfulness, four foundations of mindfulness, body, feeling, mind states, phenomena, and then skillful samadhi, which is, again, most often translated as concentration. 
but it's sort of the, the collectedness of the mind, the having the mind be very, um, very collected, not, not scattered at all. So if we think about relational dharma in terms of the eightfold path, you know, it seems that um, you know, the majority of the path is really focused on how we relate to each other um, in, this, uh, in this world. Um, and there's a very famous passage where um, Ananda, who was the Buddha's younger cousin and his attendant said to the Buddha, he said, um, you know, venerable Lord, it seems to me that having um, good, good companions, good friends, noble companions, that that is half the holy life. And the Buddha said, oh, no, Ananda, don't say that, Ananda. That is not correct, Ananda. Uh, good friends, um, you know, skillful, um, I'm trying to remember exactly how it's said. It's, um, you know, good friends, um, noble companions. That is the whole of the holy life. And what's so interesting to me is um, that we often think about, you know, the life of the Buddha and, and the um, the monks, but so much of what the Buddha um, taught with his uh, his community was really about how to get along together. There's a, a story in one of the suttas where the Buddha and Ananda come across a monk who was really sick, and he was in his own little hut. He had dysentery. He was lying in his own excrement. No one had taken care of him, and the Buddha and Ananda uh, clean up this poor monk and um, uh, take care of him. And then the Buddha calls the whole assembly. And he says, you know, why did no one take care of this, this monk? And one of the monks said, he was not useful to us. And the Buddha really chastises them. He said, you know, you have come here to live together. You no longer live with your mother and father, your your family of origin. This is your family. You need to take care of each other. You need to live with this kind of regard for each other. And, um, and it was, uh, you know, this, this idea that they were like a family that, um, and if you ever um, go online and look at the Vinaya, which is the list of, of rules that monks have to observe. Um, and there are more than 200 of them and there are even more for nuns. So many of them are about personal hygiene. I mean, they're just, uh, what kind of medicine you can have, what you, I mean, they're, they're just so nitpicky in, in some ways, but it was because in the Buddhist community, people from different, different castes, um, where came together from different life experiences came together. And the Buddha wanted to make sure that they could live in harmony. So there are all these rules about, well, this is the way we're gonna do it. And often in the Vinaya, there's a story about why it is that this rule came to be because monks were arguing over what was the right way to do it. So everybody actually is supposed to like urinate the same way. And I believe it's urinating, like not standing up completely, but I'm not. Don't quote me on that, but I, I think that, I mean, there are just all these sort of personal things when you have a lot of people living together. Uh, how, do you, how do you live in a way that, that minimizes friction? And, um, and so it's, it's just interesting to think that, that a lot of the, what the Buddha was involved in sort of administratively was like sorting out relationships. How, do, how can we get all these people from very different backgrounds, some who have a lot of experience in practice, some who don't. People were, you know, becoming ordained. Sometimes people were leaving. And in the nuns' community, it was often that uh, the nuns' community was a refuge for widowed women, for abandoned women, for women who were disgraced in some ways. And a lot of the women who came there came there with a very strong spiritual interest. But a lot of women came because it was a safe, safe place for them to be. 
And it was all about taking care of each other. And sometimes when we read the, the poems that the nuns wrote, they're all so beautiful about regarding each other as sister or as grandmother or as friend um, and how much they, they helped each other. So even in the, the sort of monastic communities of the Buddhist time, so much of it was about how do we relate to each other skillfully? And one of the things that, that um, I found slightly amusing, you know, this um, image of the, or statue of, of the Buddha here, this is the no fear mudra. Um, um, but many, 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 many years ago, when I was in Thailand, there was a display of like the seven, like a Buddha for every day of the week with a different um, gesture. And the one that, the only one I remember out of all seven was this one, the Buddha's like this. And it is dispelling the family quarrels. So, um, you know, you, you might want to have one of those little images in your, in your house, dispelling the family, the family uh, quarrels. Another arena in which the Buddha um, left instructions about um, how, to, um, how to get along relationally was in cultivation of the paramis. And paramis are, sometimes they're translated, excuse me, as qualities of perfection, but actually the paramis are what we might think of as, as virtues, but they're the things to cultivate, to live in harmony. And there are 10 of them. And there, uh, it's generosity or morality, which is sometimes um, translated as integrity, how to, how to live a life of, with ethical integrity, um, renunciation, um, wisdom, um, Viria energy, which also gets translated as courage, patience, truthfulness, determination or perseverance, loving kindness and equanimity. And you know, these are all um, expressions when we are engaging um, with each other, as well as some of them might be like engaging with our practice, like perseverance and patience. Um, but often these are exactly the qualities that we find ourselves um, in need of in our relationships with, with other, um, other persons. And even um, I would say sometimes our relationship with our, our pets, we need a considerable amount of uh, patience and um, loving kindness, um, perseverance, um, so all of these in, in the, the teachings are all about how we learn to live in harmony um, with each other. And I think about often um, our, the Brahma Vihara practices and the Brahma Viharas, the translation of that is they're the divine abodes, um, the great places that we can let our minds rest. So if you think about it as like sort of, um, Peaceful dwelling places for the mind would be one way to think about the Brahma Viharas. And the Buddha said, one of the Brahma Viharas is always accessible to us. And the first is loving kindness, which is when we um, abandon ill will and we just have this sort of, of um, warmth, concern for ourselves. No. May we be free from harm. May we live in ease. Um, may we be, have strength. And I always include, may we accept ourselves completely just as we are right now with great kindness. So we have this loving kindness practice that we do for ourselves, but also for others. And when we do the practice, we do it for people we care about and people that who are strangers to us that we don't know at all. And even eventually we do this practice for the persons who are uh, the challenging persons in our, our lives. Um, compassion practice and compassion, self-compassion practice or compassion practice is when we um, have, a, uh, we see suffering, we understand 
suffering and we have a response that is a response wishing for that suffering to be alleviated. Um, when uh, I love this little factoid that um, when um, the monks who, Tibetan monks who have practiced compassion for you know, decades um, were examined by the people at, um, uh, in, in Madison, the um, people who are studying sort of the physiology of compassion, what they noticed was that when these monks are in a state of compassion, that they uh, have um, more oxytocin in their bloodstream, you know, the, the hormone that's all about connecting. And they also have a little shot of dopamine, which is sort of the primer to act. So it's, you know, compassion physiologically makes us um, connect and primes us to act. Um, we have the, the mudita practice or the um, sympathetic joy practice when we, we can be glad for the happiness of, of another being. Again, that's um, a beautiful relational practice. And when we have uh, joy for our own good fortune, the response often is, and may this, this good fortune, this good thing that's happened to me, may my happiness be a benefit to all beings everywhere. That we have this, this wanting to let whatever goodness we experience um, be shared um, with, with others. And finally, we have the equanimity practice, which is, is sort of the big picture practice. It's the practice that recognizes um, impermanence. It's the practice that is able to, um, to keep things in perspective, to have some balance, to understand that, um, that events are impersonal in in a way that events are the result of causes. And we see a kind of impersonality in that. And we recognize our own limitations too when we do an equanimity practice. Um, so these are all um, deeply rooted in our um, in our day-to-day, -day, um, can be deeply rooted in our day-to-day our -day, um, interactions and that we can um, we can really turn our antennae to seeing these as forms of practice throughout the day. Sometimes, um, particularly in, in a place like Thailand, it may be that someone will choose to work on one of these paramis for a year. They'll just decide, okay, this is this is what I'm going to work on this year. It's going to be patience. It's going to be generosity. I mean, and that's a wonderful uh, kind of resolution to have just to say, okay, this is what I'm going to pay attention to, um, to this, um, this year. Or you know, we might decide that we really want to um, really focus on uh, a practice of self-compassion, that that's what's really needed in this, in this moment. Or a practice of sympathetic joy, appreciative joy. So, you know, these are, are all um, wonderful, wonderful practices that we can incorporate um, into, into our lives that, and I find in, in all these cases that our mindfulness practice really supports all of these, that there's such a wonderful dovetailing because we've learned how to pay attention and that we pay attention, um, we are um, so much, um, we can see our own actions, uh, our own intentions more clearly when we pay attention. And Sharon Salzberg has a, a wonderful um, saying that, that seems to me really true, that attention is the doorway to compassion. Attention is the doorway to compassion. And when we really look at um, sort of what's going on in the world and see it in its complexity and see the complexity of, of the causes of all the sorts of things that lead to extremely 
um, uh, troubling, distressing circumstances um, that we really can have more compassion when we really pay attention to it. And, um, and I, I would say that that's something too that I, I think I have um, learned from um, practicing with um, people who are incarcerated, who in many ways are, are very wise, very, um, have become very, um, very good at understanding um, themselves and often very dedicated to, to practice, but it's, um, you know, seeing that um, and seeing sort of some of the difficult circumstances that they've come from is really a great generator of, um, of compassion. Um, Ruth King, uh, who is a wonderful, wonderful teacher and has been here, um, she was here probably now five or six years ago at Common Ground, who wrote a wonderful book called Mindful of Race that is well, well, well worth your time to, um, to read. Ruth often begins when, when there's a, a group gathered together. Um, she has people say, I am here because you are here. You are here because I am here. Our hearts are old friends. And sometimes she will encourage people like in this, and she did it in this very Dharma hall, get up and walk around and just kind of hold your heart. And to every person you meet, that our hearts are old friends. And to really believe that, again, with this capacity to care, that my caring heart is an old friend of your caring heart. So it is a, um, a beautiful practice. Um, sharing the merit is another wonderful relational practice. Um, you know, I think it's where we get to practice just enormous um, imaginative generosity, you know, that we just send our, our good wishes out. If there's any benefit, to what I'm doing. May all these different people share in it. May the planet share in it. Um, may our animals share in it. Um, uh, Valerie Carr, the um, wonderful um, Sikh activist, um, often says that one of the principles of the Sikh religion is see no stranger. That's one of their core teachings is see no stranger. It's just someone you don't know yet. There are no strangers. See no strangers. So I thought I would finish this tonight with um, a reading from a sutta. Um, and it's the uh, Maha Mangala Sutta, uh, the sutta about what are the blessings that we have. And what I'd like you to look for as I read them, because it's a, a varied list, how many of them are about our relational lives, about how we are with each other. So the Buddha was asked, um, you know, what are the highest blessings? And the Buddha says, not to associate with the foolish, but to associate with the wise and to honor those worthy of honor. This is the highest blessing. To reside in a suitable locality, to have performed meritorious actions in the past and to set oneself in the right direction. This is the highest blessing. Vast learning, skill in handicrafts, well-grounded in discipline and pleasant speech. This is the highest blessing. To support one's father and mother, to cherish one's partner and children, and to be engaged in peaceful occupations. This is the highest blessing. Tolerance, righteous conduct, rendering assistance to relatives and performance of blameless deeds. This is the highest blessing. To cease and abstain from evil, to abstain from intoxicating drinks and diligent in performing righteous acts. 
This is the highest blessing. Reverence, humility, contentment, gratitude, and the timely hearing of the Dhamma, the teaching of the Buddha. This is the highest blessing. Patience, obedience, meeting wise teachers and timely discussions on the Dhamma. This is the highest blessing. Self-control, chastity, comprehension of the noble truths, and the realization of Dibbana. This is the highest blessing. The mind that is not touched by the vicissitudes of life, or sometimes we call them the worldly winds. The mind that is free from sorrow, stainless and secure. This is the highest blessing. Those who have fulfilled the conditions for such blessings are victorious everywhere and attain happiness everywhere. To them are the highest blessings. So there's this whole, <clears throat> whole list of all things. So this is the highest blessing and this is the highest blessing. Look at all these, these amazing blessings in, in our lives. The one that sort of surprised me was vast learning, skill in handicrafts, well-grounded in discipline and pleasant speech all about how we, how we live our lives, do what we, we can do um, to support our parents, to cherish our partner, our children, to be engaged in peaceful occupations. These are the highest blessings. And then to you know, be able to engage in righteous conduct, rendering assistance to relatives, performance of blameless deeds, <clears throat> reverence, humility, contentment, gratitude, timely hearing of the Dhamma, I mean, this is our <clears throat> this is our life, right? This is this is what we we can aspire to. And the Buddha says, this is a blessed life. So, <clears throat> so it seemed to me, especially as we have a, a holiday that coming up that is um, even with its very complicated origins, um, it's it's a day where we can think about gratitude and think about what the blessings of our lives are and how the Dharma is just, is and, and can be, you know, infused in our everyday life that our practice really is living in harmony <clears throat> with each other, living in harmony with the planet, um, you know, being the, um, being the, the person who um, you know makes other people's days better? Being the the good listener, being the person who shows up, being the person who doesn't abandon. You know this is this is the dharma of, of relationships. It's how we are, how we are um, with others, and as the Buddha says, this is the holy life. Our, our association with others is really the holy life. And that we do what we can to support each other. So when we come together like this on Zoom and here in person, what we're really doing is um, we're offering support to each other and we're getting support from each other. And this is what Sangha is. You know, one of the, one of the three, uh, they talk about, the, we all talk about the triple uh, triple jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And the Sangha, the community that comes together. This is the great blessing. And how we, um, how we do our best to live in honesty and in harmony with each other is really, um, it is a blessing that we have this precious human life, this incredibly precious human life, where we get to just care immensely. Um, we, are, we are so, so, so fortunate. And, um, and so with that, um, I thank you all for your, your very kind attention and would be happy to hear um, your reflections if you have any, any questions, that's fine. But if you have uh, any reflections on living the Dharma um, or the blessings that we have, um, it would be lovely to share it with others. And I've got a mic, a mic here. And if you're on um, Zoom, we can try to do that, um, that too. So who would like to, to share something?
Kevin, you want to go first? There we go. Do you want to come here and be on camera, or let's see if every, everyone can hear if you. Okay. All right. So. Yeah. Hi, my name's Kevin here in Minneapolis. Um, I was just listening and this last summer I spent, oh, at least a couple of months doing road trips through the West, the Western states, um, partly, um, you know, the, the red states, the Trump supporters, and just to go and kind of watch you know, kind of see what I could see. And, um, you know, when I headed out this summer, I expected to run into, uh, you know, kind of the stereotypes, you know, that we get here in the city, you know, of gun toting, um, you know, all, all those stereotypes. I don't need to go into them. And, um, I was surprised that I, I never ran into that once that, um, you know, when you go out through the West and see how people live their lives, um, you know, there, there was nothing hateful, you know, they had, you know, valued community and friendships and they were trying to make a living and take care of their family. And um, yeah, but just listening, I mean, what kind of, I thought about was, you know, when you go on in community, it's kind of like you run into what you bring with you a lot. And um, so, you know, studying the Dharma, you know, if you study, you know, compassion and gratitude and, and um, generosity, that's all you can really see in other people. And the only thing that was upsetting is like when you turn on to the AM radio, which is all they have, um, a lot of it's community radio, what's going on in the schools and crop reports and that. But like the national AM radio was just very hateful. Um, you know, I could only listen to it a few minutes at a time before I had to turn it off. And... Um, and that's what these people are listening to, or at least some of them. So, um, if, um, you know, of course, you know, if they're just hearing these, you know, ra you know, racist and misogynist and, and, you know, that kind of talk, of course, it's going to make it, make it into their life. But I, I never really, I never really ran into that. So. I'll give it to Anne in a minute, but what I, what that reminds me of is there's a, um, sort of this, this story about there is a woman you know, in ancient times, a woman sat outside the city gate and she had water and travelers who were coming and come to the city would stop by her her little tent and get some water and, and take a breath before they entered the gates of the city. And that uh, traveler came and said to her, well, you know, what am I going to, you know, what are the people like in this city? And she says, to him, the traveler, she says, well, what are the people like where you come from? And he said, oh, they're they're wonderful people. They're just kind and generous and, um, you know, they're just so good. And she said, well, you will find that here. And then, you know, another person comes and you can immediately see where this is going, you know, well, what are the people, you know, what are the people like where you come from? Oh, they're terrible. They're awful. They lie. They cheat. They're, they're miserable. She said, well, you'll find that here. So it's, uh, you know, what you were saying, Kevin, sort of sometimes what you, what you, we bring as our, uh, prejudice or, or expectation um, really affects uh, what we actually see. Um, so, Anne, you wanted to say something? 
Okay. But then you come closer. Yeah. Um, sometimes this is called a wisdom and compassion practice. And I don't, why is compassion not one of the Brahma Viharis? Well, compassion is one of the Brahma Viharas. It's not one of the paramis. And I have asked this question um, myself. And um, I was told one of the responses is, well, compassion is a form of loving kindness. It's one of the flavors of metta. So that if, if we understand metta um, you know, as, as the uh, abandoning of, of ill will, this is one of the the flavors of it. And uh, Venerable Analio has this wonderful visual for it. Um, Analio says that um, the uh, you know, meta is like the sun at noon uh, shining on everything. Um, compassion is like the sun at dusk. And it's sort of a little melancholy. It's um, um, Sympathetic joy is like the, the sun in the morning, the rising sun, which seems to be so, so energizing. Uh, and equanimity is like the light of the full moon. And it's a kind of cooler, different light that, that allows us to see things a little differently. But the other answer I did get about compassion, and I, um, I actually asked this to Gil Fronstall years ago, and he said, well, um, you know, not every Buddha has compassion. And I was just shocked. And there's, there's a, a kind of Buddha called a Pacheka Buddha. And that is someone who goes off and through his or her or their own um, practice study realizes um, liberation, uh, completely lets go of um, greed, hatred, delusion, um, obsession with self is completely self-liberated, but doesn't teach, doesn't share. And the Buddha, what is, people always talk about the Buddha teaching out of compassion, because when the Buddha first awakened, the Buddha said uh, to himself, you know, this will be tiresome. Not very many people are going to get this. I don't think um, given his years of, of you know, asceticism before that and all of his experience, I don't think other people are going to get this. So his initial impulse was not to teach. And the story is that a, a heavenly being came down and said to him, there are people with only a little dust in their eyes who would be so grateful for this. And then the Buddha decided to teach. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of the, the story um, sort of mythic story about that. But um, what we can take from that is, is this idea that teaching is an act of compassion. Um, so that's just sort of going in two different directions. And I was really shocked when someone said, you know, you don't need, you don't need compassion to be uh, liberated in the sense of letting go of, of the fetters. So that would be like, being liberated without any relational uh, dharma at all, just being kind of a, a hermit who self-liberates. Um, but that's another um, response to um, to that. Mm -hmm. T. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I want to respond, respond to what you, Kevin, was talking about because I'm so in response to what I would, what you were mentioning about your experience with um, people from the other side of the political aisle. Like I personally from the deep south, so I have like a lot of experience with like like I mean being with I mean being with the population because and it it really goes back to how. I think like 
it's it's the lack of compassion and self compassion and compassion that what I'm that's what I'm seeing from um from the like from the from the people as a whole and and a lot of times it's I don't know it and understand where they're coming from why they don't have compassion because they're not taught that way because they're taught um to to have us versus them mentality they're taught to be like oh okay well you don't believe x y or z then then you must be a racist or you must be that it's actually and i'm and i'm like well i'm an asian in the deep south where where i don't see it like a lot of times i don't even see that's the case neither and it's just a lot of times it's what the media actually says one thing and i'm like wait is that really really what is happening i mean yes there might be some extreme cases but in general people down there uh, do not be the way that the media would like us to believe but anyway what i'm saying is is that i think it goes back to compassion and understanding experience but i have my own question my question is is when you mention about the highest order uh, like high i mean highest blessing like i guess this and when you mention like some of the specific activities that one would or things that one would do i don't know like maybe i just can't quite comprehend but is it is it more of perfectionism per se or am i misinterpreting it <laughs> that is a really good question is um, I, this idea about the highest blessings, is this perfectionism. And what we know is that perfectionism is really toxic, that we know that, that perfectionism is about never being good enough, never, you know, there, there's no way to be, be perfect. As I, I mentioned, Ruth said, you know, life is, um, is imperfect. Um, trans impermanent and impersonal. Um, so when we hear this sort of the highest blessings, I see this as much more of a sort of poetic rendering that is sort of a, a rhetorical uh, structure in here. These are the, the highest, um, highest blessings. Um, you know, perfectionism is one of the things that people talk about particularly as um, a feature of um, white dominant culture. This idea about um, you know perfection is um, you have to be perfect. It's never ever good enough, and this is supposed to be kind of what keeps us motivated to do better. But actually, what it does is it shames and undermines us instead of um, being able to relate to our own. Um, our own human um, fallibility. And that's what we, we are all fallible in that way. So in talking about compassion, it seems to me that perfectionism is uh, kind of one of the um, enemies of, of compassion. Um, but that's a, um, that's a great question. And if we interpret um, the Buddha's teaching as telling us that we have to strive to be perfect, that really is sort of um, a cultural overlay, I think, of the Buddha telling us, you know, to try to, to do our best. Um, and, and this, um, you know, that these sorts of, of translations, I looked actually at three different translations of the, um, of this sutta, and they're all pretty, pretty stiff, and some of them render it in more of a like poetic verses. So, um, but it's, it's really just uh, wonderfully expressing that there are lots of blessings in our life. Oh, this is the highest blessing. Well, this is also the highest blessing. And this one is the highest blessing. So it's, it's about not ranking them, like walking up, a, you know, going up a ladder. It's like all of these things are really extraordinary blessings in, uh, in our lives. Um, and it is, I, I think, in any practice, um, especially here 
in the West with the dominant culture that we have, it is very, very easy to sort of slip into what is clearly an unhealthy perfectionism. Um, this is really about, I believe, living in, in uh, harmony, living with great care, living with great tenderness, great love. And um, perfectionism is kind of incompatible with love in any of its forms. So we're just about um, out of time. Um, and I really appreciate your, um, your being here. So let's, um, let's do the um, sharing of the merit. And then um, Ryan's going to say something. So again, this beautiful act of imaginative generosity of relational dharma. If there's any goodness to our practice, any benefit or blessing or merit, we would gladly, happily, joyfully share it with others. In fact, if we could, we would give it all away, every bit of it. We would share any blessings with our teachers, our parents, our families, our friends. We would share any goodness with our community. We'd share the merit with the people we like and also the people we don't like so much. We would share any blessings with the people we know and the millions upon millions of people that we have yet to know. And in addition to all the two-leggeds, we would share any blessings, any goodness with the four-leggeds, the many-leggeds, the winged, the scaly, the slimy, and the finny. May all beings find a path to peace. May all beings be free from suffering. Hi, this is Ryan. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, just a quick uh, note that Common Ground offers all programs in the spirit of generosity. Um, there's a couple of different ways to do that. If um, that motivates you, um, there's volunteerism here. Common Ground's largely ran by volunteers and a, a few paid staff, teacher and office staff. Um, there's also uh, financial giving that um, uh, that you could do. There's out there. There's a, a cash or a, a donable there. Um, there's also a little a credit station there, or you could go online for Zoomers. There's there's the link there, but you could just go on the the website. Um, if you give for today, please note um, Patrice. Uh, how do you, how do you say your last name? Couch rhymes. Couch. Kelch, uh, Kelch rhymes, that gave you a tongue twister. Um, please put um, Patrice in the teacher uh, fun box there. You'll see it when you go online. Two thirds of the donation supports the teachers and one th third supports uh, the general operations of the center. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone. Have a good evening.